Uh, there's an inter another interesting idea, a third kind of uh, uh, tendency which famous religious belief is uh, advanced by the psychologist Paul Bloom in a fascinating book called Descartes' Baby, uh, where he reviews a whole bunch of uh, research, which is fairly standard now in uh, the literature on cognitive psychology, in which uh, we seem to have uh, a, a kind of a folk physics. We, in other words, a set of uh, basic default assumptions, probably again innate, uh, because you can see them in babies of just a few weeks old. Uh, in assumptions about the physical world, so that if something's solid, it can't pass through another solid object. Okay, things like that. Basic, very basic assumptions, which if you create computer-generated movies in which those assumptions are violated, babies pay attention. They sit up, they exhibit typical symptoms of surprise, like they look for longer, okay, or they stop sucking on a you know, there are interesting ways of measuring surprise in, in babies of a few weeks old. And you, by looking at how surprised they are in terms of their reactions to different kinds of uh, movies, you can see, you can infer stuff about what they tend to assume about the world. And you can therefore reconstruct kind of folk physics that they seem to have, which is quite Newtonian in many ways, and definitely not Einsteinian, which is probably why it took so long for Einstein to come up with his counterintuitive physics. So there's also a similar set of assumptions that, uh, or, which constitute a kind of folk psychology and which is pretty advanced. I mean, we're all, we've had thousands and thousands of years of evolution favoring the development of quite sophisticated understanding of each other's psychology, right? We had to be. We're all, and this is known as the Machiavellian <coughs> intelligence hypothesis. The important point here is that Bloom and others have argued that these kind of uh, sets of uh, tools for understanding the world are informationally encapsulated. In other words, we f we tend to be, uh, the stuff that's in one category we apply to, we're very good at applying to one set of things, and then when we apply the other set of uh, categories, we can't, or the other set of tools, we kind of can't apply the first one. So it's a bit like a, a necker cube illusion. We either see things one way or the other. We can't easily combine them. We can't make them two run at the same time. They don't mix and match. They don't sort of flow into each other. And because, of, because these domains are quite separate, he argues that this favors uh, a natural kind of tendency to think of ourselves as composed of two quite distinct substances. In other words, to be, or as he says, Descartes, paper, to be natural Cartesians in a way to think of ourselves both as things, as bodies, and as minds, but to find it very difficult to see how the one could actually be just a function of the other. Uh, again, I don't have much time to go into it now, but I recommend the book. Finally, the last sort of thing I'd like to talk about in terms of uh, mental tendencies to believe in religious ideas is, is what I'll call credence heuristics. You can think of the other three, the previous three, uh, apophenia, different types of apophenia, the, um, the memorable anomalies, and the natural born dualism. All of those three kind of tendencies as things that can explain both how religion are, gets off the ground in the first place, and how religion then is easier to is relatively easy to transmit from generation to generation. The last thing doesn't really about, doesn't help us to explain how religion gets off the ground in the first place, but it does, I think, add a lot to our understanding of how religion can transfer to generation, to, from generation to generation. Uh, and if you, because if you, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but there seems to be a rather strong correlation between the religious beliefs of parents and children. It's very it, rare to have a Muslim child of a Christian parent. Okay? And now, you know, that's kind of, uh, odd unless there's some kind of uh, bias perhaps in, in children to believe what your parents tell you. And again, there are good evolutionary reasons why we would think that that might be favored by natural selection, okay? Uh, maybe there were once upon a time there was polymorphism in a gene that, uh, or a number of genes that affected children's tendency to uh, believe what their parents told them. Maybe there was a bunch of some, some mutant skeptics, right? that were around before that were very, very skeptical of what their parents told them. And, you know, when their parents said, don't play in that river, there's crocodiles in there, they thought, ah, you're just, I wonder you're just winding me up. And guess what happened to their genes? 
right? They ended up in the crocodile. Now, the other kids who were like blase, who were naive, said, oh, mummy says there's a crocodile in that river, don't play there. Okay, it's better safe than sorry, their genes probably were passed on more effectively. But they, in, in the process, of course, it allows their parents to pass on lots of uh, claptrap, like, you know, your ancestors are watching you. And that, again, it, it is reflecting the old Jesuits dictum, give me a child until the age of seven. And uh, I can't remember what else that concluded with. It might have been something rather dirty. But uh, I think if you take all of these four uh, things, and perhaps some other things, then uh, you can conclude that uh, it's... Um, that religion is kind of almost the natural state for people to be in. It, there are powerful forces in our psychology which make it easy to believe and easy to pass on religious beliefs and much harder to uh, reject those beliefs. Um, so well, given that I'm an atheist, you know, uh, I'm sort of saying that the majority of people are therefore in some kind of error. and. Uh, but I think it's incumbent, if uh, whenever a minority, an atheist, let's, uh, then we might be a majority in this particular room, that's an extremely unusual circumstance. Atheists are in a, a very significant, insignificant minority usually, and uh, whenever a minority accuses the majority of error, it's incumbent on the minority, I think, to explain how they managed to avoid the error and the others did not, okay? Like, how, look at all the Marxists, right? How come they didn't get sucked in by the ideology of capitalism. That's what you have to ask the Marxist. Um, so, and I think, you know, it, atheists, the, the kind of, the way atheists can explain that is, you know, it's, it's actually uh, that science itself also, and rational beliefs, must be favored by some cognitive features too. They must be, otherwise, you know, if, they, if it was completely unnatural, I mean, this is a title of a book by Lewis Walpert, The Unnatural Nature of Science, which I think is a nice title, it sums up something. You know, science, a lot of scientific principles, the basic principles of science may be, uh, relate to common sense. But where, as they're developed and built upon and refined, they, we end up with some very counterintuitive theories. Relativity theory, quantum mechanics, and so on. They're all desperately counterintuitive. Even things that today that we may take for granted, like the germ theory of disease, it's easy to forget how counterintuitive something like that appeared to most people even just a hundred odd years ago. The idea that there were animals so small that you couldn't see them with the naked eye that were responsible for causing disease was just laughed out of court. But nevertheless, uh, you know, science must be favored by some cognitive features. But, and perhaps in some people it's that we're able, perhaps through some uh, accident of birth, just like religious people, and uh, maybe some lucky genes that predispose us towards a lower level of that apophenia. We are, uh, we're able to uh, build on those kind of cognitive features and overcome the, the otherwise stronger forces, um, which I think, because in general, those cognitive forces that favor science must be weaker than those that favor religion. And that because religion has such a dominant uh, power and seems to be, despite the talk of secularization, coming back and, and very resistant to, to any attempts to overcome it. So it's a very powerful force. So I want to uh, sort of think about that, um, to just conclude by thinking about five possible futures. And I think that this, you know, people can say, well, okay, very interesting, all this stuff, speculation, but why does it matter? And I think it does matter because it's only by really studying these things scientifically that we can begin to uh, get a picture of, you know, what are the likely futures and it, this is a, you know, these are very important questions for, for, for the world as a whole because, um, you know, they, 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 uh, they influence all sorts of questions on you know, our possibility for tech, continued progress, world peace, and so on. So I want to think about, I'm going to just briefly describe five possible futures. Now, I'm not, these are not exhaustive. This list is not exhaustive. There are other possibilities, and you, I'll leave it up to your imagination to think of more. But each of these five hypotheses that I'm going to present has the merit of at least highlighting some extremes that are taken seriously by some people. And what's remarkable, I think, about this set is that just about anybody would find at least one of them preposterous, or troubling, or even deeply offensive. But every one of them is not just anticipated, but actually yearned for by some people in the world. 
and people act on what they yearn for. Now, at the very least, I think we could all agree that we're in, people in the world today are at cross purposes about religion. So, if we can anticipate some of the possible problems um, and some of the possible futures, we might save ourselves from wasted effort and counterproductive campaigns. If we're lucky, and all-out war and genocidal catastrophe is the norm. So, here are these five uh, hypotheses. Here's one for possible future. The Enlightenment is long gone. The creeping secularization of modern societies that has been anticipated for two centuries.